my name is Norman, and I'm here with Raz. Hi, everyone. Great to meet you again. <laughs> Good. I'm glad you're li- someone's listening. <laughs> yeah, someone is listening, at least me. To you and you to me. It's good to see and you, Norman. Um, always a pleasure. How are things? Yeah, things been all right. I'm excited for today's episode because I have some important questions to ask you to start off with. Ask me. I have a yeah. feeling this is going to be another discussion in the genre that is closest to your heart. <laughs> science fiction. Absolutely. Science fiction. I love science fiction. I never Let me knew kick it off. You. I never knew... You- you were such a big science fiction fan. This is amazing. I am a massive science fiction nerd. I, my first pickup lines fit girls was all science fiction related. I didn't succeed with any of the girls. I used my lightsaber jokes on, but you know, I enjoyed it. Do you have any examples of uh, what do you say? They are not appropriate for this audience. <laughs> We haven't really landed so, on what the segment, the target segment is here, aside from ourselves. So, <laughs> Well, we are, we are trying to figure it out. So here are some questions. Yeah, go for it. Did you, did you ever thought about what it's like to be a human? Perhaps what is it like to be alive? Maybe have you ever thought about buying a ship made out of wires to express your social status? There's a lot of questions there. Can I unpack that? <laughs> A second yeah 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 and and you, and you ask me if you can't yeah you I don't mean, you don't really need to answer these to be honest but okay, if you, you want know, to keep them rhetorical but uh, are you providing some answers to these questions no no i have no <laughs> intention so <laughs> the, the the reason i'm asking you these questions is because today's author philip k dick has asked these questions among many others in his books that I'd like to introduce you to. These books have inspired movies like Blade Runner, Minority Report, and Total Recall, if any of these sound familiar to you. And, you know, he has he has been a very prolific actor in the existential sci-fi genre, where he explored different areas of consciousness and different areas of empathy, and understanding and give us some really freaking good stories. Hmm. I actually, I really loved Blade Runner and I'm sure a lot of people did. I love the first one, the, yeah. um, the, the latest one with Ryan Gosling, great cinematography, but I didn't buy into the story as much. But the first one was just unbelievable. Fair the um, the idea of, of um, what is it, robots, um, uh, facing the, the elements of, of, of human emotion and in human, well, human being to some extent. Um, that, that whole story was fascinating and amazing, amazing movie. But um, yeah, let's dive into it. Sure. I will probably spend most of the time talking about Blade Runner or as the book titled, Do Android Stream of Electric Sheep. But I can get into other books as well later on because as I said, Philip K. Dick did cover similar themes across his books. I just want just to do to... a shout out, shout out to the name of the author, Philip K. Dick. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Amazing, yeah. amazing name. Yeah, every joke he makes is a dick joke. And um, so just about him, now that we talk about his name, it's worth noting that he himself had a very interesting life beside writing interesting books. Um, he had over five wives. Actually, I think he had five wives. F- wives. God, he ma- he got married five times. All right. And what at one point, happened? apparently, what, what was happened that? to them? What happened to them? <laughs> Did he just get divorced, or uh, was it like? I, I guess so. It, it's Harry unclear. Did. I get no. I don't. I don't think Philip was that that aggressive. Um, he was. He was so not aggressive that he. Um, I think he was just a mess, to be honest. He was a bit of a because dick. Because the other thing, he was a bit of a dick. And his, his wives realized that he was being a bit of a dick. And um, with, with, with his life, besides the five um, marriages and at least four divorces, it's worth noting that he was really poor at one point so much that he was eating pet food instead of normal human food. And um, he had a range of addictions, depression disorders, panic issues as well, 
as well as during the filming of the first Blade Runner movie with Harrison Ford, when he was still alive, he actually attacked Harrison Ford, thinking that Harrison Ford was a robot. So this kind of shows you how his, where his mind was or where his mind was not. Interesting. Um, first mm-hmm. of all, I didn't know that pet food was, is pet food cheaper than regular food? Because I had the impression it was quite expensive. I, I think so. Depends pet on what pet food you eat. It's if it, certain pets are not as, as needy as others, That's as well as what human food you like. I have so many questions. And then the, do you know more about the details of why he attacked Harrison Ford? Uh, was he hungry or was he or was just one of the <laughs> <laughs> other issues, other mental problems that he, he was facing at the time? Or I, I he wasn't enjoying his issues. acting. He wasn't happy with it. He was, he was insane, time. I think. I don't oh. think he wanted to munch on Harrison at all. <laughs> I don't think he was that hungry after the pet food. <laughs> <laughs> and um, but yeah, so he was he was practically insane. At one point, he went through like a, a religious stage. So he talked about religion as well, obviously within a science fiction um, framework. He talked about talked about his own addiction through a book called Scanner Darkly, which is probably the closest to his biography and what he went through. It was made into a movie as well. Many people think that's probably the best movie they ever made based on his work. So. But but in general, like he, he wrote sci-fi. So if you like sci-fi, you're probably going to come across Philip K. Dick's work one way or another. It's worth noting that he wrote sci-fi in the 1970s and, and 80s and 60s when technology wasn't as, as developed. So a lot of his ideas could be seen as outdated. And a lot of his stories do focus more on human interaction rather than the actual technology. Not sure if this is a good thing or a bad thing. Right. I just have to say, that, you know, you've enumerated some of his, his books. I just, I didn't realize um, there was this prolific writer with such a dark uh, backstory behind two of my favorite movies, uh, Blade Runner and Minority Report. Minor, Minority yeah. Report with, with uh, Tom Cruise, if I remember correctly. Another yeah. ama- amazing movie that I could watch again anytime. Cool. I actually watched quite a few Philip K. Dick movies and didn't realize it was Philip K. Dick. It was just, it was, they were just all movies that I was like, wow, this is amazing. They are so interesting. And then I was like, oh, it's actually written by the same guy. Um, like one of my personal favorite one is Next by, with Nicolas Cage. Not sure if you ever heard that. The movie? No. Yeah, Next. Have you ever watched that movie? No, I don't think so. It's the, the premise is that there's this guy who sees something like, two or three minutes into the future and how he reacts and what he does. And uh, yeah, that's, it's just very interesting. It's just the way it's done. It's, it's super cool. And I guess the underlying aspect of most of Philip K. Dick's stories is, is paranoia. It's everything and everyone is paranoid and constantly changing. Uh, although a lot of his stories do start off very, very standard. So just to give you an example, do Android's dream of electric ship, aka Blade Runner, I will refer to it as Blade Runner from now on, is a, a sci-fi noir. So it's a detective story where the main character is a detective or a headhunter that needs to hunt down five androids. They call them androids in the book. And in the movie, it's called Replicants. And these robots are not like, they are not made out of metal or at least not that's not how they describe this, but they have the human flesh, so they, they do more or less act and feel human, but they have something and robotic about them. And the main conflict around the story is these androids trying to become human, fit into human society, often be becoming important members of human society, cherished members of human society, while the actual humans are losing their own humanity and questioning whether or who they are or whether what they are, if that makes sense. Hmm. And And was that in the face of these, these creatures being extremely capable? Is that it being superior in many aspects? 
it, it, it's a bit of both. So one of the key aspects, and I don't think I'm really spoiling the story here because it's, it's, it's in the movie and the book as well in the very early, is that most of these androids only live a very short period of time. I think they live four to six years. So their, their life time is, is very, very short and limited. And kind of the, the cycle are, of uh, an election <laughs> to ensure <laughs> Yeah, they, they're like politicians. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly like that. And obviously the, this comes with a, a leverage, a benefit that these androids are incredibly talented. Yes, they are much better than humans in most things. And they can not only do things better than humans, but act human better than humans, if that makes sense. It is very interesting that the book itself talks a lot about brain activity, how a human brain works and how the android brain works. And one of the characters in the book is, I think, I think they call them either birds or I, it escapes me right now. But it's basically a mentally, men, mentally uh, disadvantaged human. So someone who is, you know, today would be considered to be having Down syndrome. And the point of this character is that this character takes the android test. He takes the test that's done to identify androids and he fails it. So because of his brain activity, people would actually consider him an android, although he is not. And this creates this bridge between humans and androids, like who is a human, who is an android, where where the line lies, right? So... I struggle um, to understand what would make a human robotic, what would classify. Yeah. So, I mean, everyone has a different answer to that. Philip K. Dick's answer to that is empathy. He basically focused a lot on how humans can manage to empathize, no matter how cruel, heartless, and jealous they can be. There's always something about their personality that connects with empathy. For androids, they can only fake it. And um, do you happen to know why? I think this this is not an answer here for that. I think you know Philip K. Dick was not a, a science science scientist, so he wouldn't be able to uh, describe it. And I he, think it's just he didn't go into like. The, this is these are the hormones that a uh, an android has, and this or the lack of, and humans are capable of of hormones and chemicals that are associated with emotions, including empathy. Well, here's a fun fact: he he wrote a lot about androids, but he also in some of his sci-fi he wrote about spaceships and you know the usual you know Star or Star Trek type of stuff, and. But in real life, when he talked about technology, he sounded like he was afraid of his own microwave. And he was he, he thought microwaves were too much, if that makes sense. So, so um, um, same category as people that are afraid of 5G. Uh. Yeah, yeah. He might he might have been the guy who, who thinks 5G causes COVID. I, I don't know. <laughs> but um, at the same time, his, his sci-fis are very clever and creative. And in t- maybe maybe that's why maybe because he's incredibly paranoid and and everything is 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 weird. And one of the things that I personally love about Philip K. Dick's work is that while he starts off the story as 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 very archetypical, his, his stories are almost generic when it comes to the beginning. It always puts a massive twist on it. So and so, sometimes several twists. So just to give you an example, um, similar uh, examples is how Matrix has done the, the red pill, right? In the beginning, it's all like a big city thriller slash action movie. But then when Neo takes the red pill, he wakes up and it reframes the whole thing completely. Or how in Fight Club, when you realize what the twist is, everything is reframed suddenly from the beginning and everything means something else, if that makes sense. Absolutely. And this happens in, in Philip K. Dick's stories as well. One of the central ideas in Blade Runner was the, the detective actually questioning his own humanity and at one point being convinced that he's actually an android and running down in this 
tunnel of paranoia where everything you believed so far is 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 a lie and um, everything that is that is that you thought is true makes no sense anymore and as a result you have to you know fight with these forces that that you don't know anymore it's almost like they pull the ground from beneath you if that makes sense and just trying to understand that a bit better is it because of our inability to understand the complexity of the world is it our own due to our own limitation what was driving this perception it, it it's driven by two things one is um the frame of of the story and how the how the technology impacts you so um you know the idea that for example uh and you no one can really define why an android is an android and what why is an android different from a human you we don't know we, but for some reason there's so one of the key elements of the book is that this guy has a test that uses to identify androids the one that i mentioned earlier but the test itself is is brought into question whether it's effective or not and he himself admits that he actually doesn't know why the test works or what's the mechanic behind the test so he starts to question is this test actually accurate or he's been you know hunting and killing people that just dis- failed this test but they are not actually androids and then at one point he comes across another character that identifies him as a uh, robot because he fails his test so suddenly there's this weird situation where if if you are an android that can have implanted memories that means that you are an android that believes that you are human so instead of as previously put masquerading yourself among humans you are actually someone that believes that you are human and um how do you know if you are actually human or you're just delusional and you have your memories are implanted this is that's, a, that's where it starts from this is a very interesting topic i don't know if that was the intent of the the book but this idea of of identity um do you are you something just because you believe you are are you something because other people identify you as such where is the threshold mm-hmm. between one identity and another these are very uh very common questions today right uh yeah. when we talk about a lot of things uh in kind of identity politics and so on uh interesting that he was trying to effectively if if i understand correctly he's really pushing the boundaries of of this ideology to some extent questioning right where are the boundaries between uh zero and one uh between android and human especially in the fact of, of of in the face of so much transformation there's blurring the lines between the two um which is really happen, happening with us as as a species we spoke about sapiens in a in a previous episode about how um we're you know we 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 started off with technology uh, surgery then um prosthetics then implants uh google glass and and facebook ray bands um the, the list is is endless of uh, of our transformation interesting well i'm not going to go Absolutely. further into that but um i'll let you yeah, i'll okay. let you continue a little bit that's okay i mean that's why we're here just to chat about random stuff in terms of in terms of the story story or plot devices basically after a few chapters most philip k dick stories turn upside down and you never get what you really expect another f- uh, favorite of my stories is ubik which is uh, again about a, a bunch of people that are go on a mission and it doesn't really matter what the mission is because as i said he throws it out of the window after a few chapters but essentially the storyline questions when you are really alive and when you are really dead because in this in the story one of the characters who believes he's alive realizes he's is sort of like dying or he is in a um self-induced coma only dreaming that he's alive at one point so it kind of like creates this weird situation where rereading the book you get a complete different picture on what is going on and what is happening and um in that context you know ubik is an absolute mess and it's an amazing trip because by the end you have no idea what's going on but you really enjoy it 
Mm. Is that related and, to um, the idea of um, again, what is it to be human, and the idea of of consciousness? If consciousness can exist outside a body, or or yeah. part with the part lack of a lack of uh, physicality, and you can kind of store your essence, your 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 consciousness, and transfer it into another body. Uh, yeah, is that, is that, yeah, absolutely. Is that the same idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in in many ways, I I think Philip K. Dick's stories are very similar to what you see in Black Mirror, right? Black Mirror series is famous for taking relatively, you know, trivial technologies and turning it upside down and making everything, you know, crazy and and weird and stuff, right? There is a, um, an, a an episode in Black Mirror where effectively, I think that exactly happens, right? Where someone is is uh, essence is or consciousness is captured in a device almost like a google assistant or uh, an alexa yeah Interesting. yeah yeah exactly or or the one if you remember um i think it's a christmas episode when the guy feels that he is in this little cottage but it turns out that he's like in a prison cell and he's they make him believe that he's in this cottage and he's talking to this guy and he's actually interrogated to reveal what crimes he committed, right? And that sort of stuff is what like basically creates the dread that most Philip K. Dick novels actually work with. Most of the stories are incredibly scary and 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 depressive, but it's also very interesting. And honestly, I don't think there are many sci-fi writers that I know that can twist things out so much that that you just you just no idea what's going on by the end right and but yeah, i can ask one you more thing. can, I, can oh. I ask you something about this do you think that that's possible what's your personal view on this like do you do you think that it's possible to extract someone's consciousness that can be separate from the body and and or, or mm. i mean maybe, yeah i'll mm. let you go first mm. I, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I think at this stage, if we're going to be practical, probably not. In the future, maybe. I, I think a lot depends on how your body and how what you experience with your body actually influences your your brain activity. Like, you know, can a human grow up without touching or smelling or, you know, seeing anything and still have a human brain would still be just you know, alive and, and, and functioning? Or, you know, can you pop a brain into a, a vat of liquid and then just let it, you know, spend the next 200 years thinking about math equations and, and chat with other people, right? It, it's hard to tell, I think. Hmm. What I was, what I was yeah. hearing on this topic is that um, the organic aspect, including the ability to, to set, communicate with the outside world through senses, um, is really related to our consciousness to some extent, in the, in the sense that, and this maybe as a parallel to intelligence, you don't, you know, you can't really have. They, they tried this a lot with robots, having smart robots, and and in putting creating AI just on a chip somewhere, and never really took off until it gave it a body. So if you remember those Boston robotics dogs and so on, mm -hmm. the fact that they had some sensors in them actually allowed them to be intelligent. And I think you know intelligence and is kind of correlated with with consciousness. So I think that there's something about us being organic creatures, you know, made of the carbon with our senses, that makes us also aware. And I also think our consciousness is not really. I read this very fascinating book. Um, I think it's on it's on a Jordan B. Peterson book list. I just took it and and read it. A very very complex book by Jan Panksepp. Uh, that is kind of the neuro neuroscience of emotions is called very difficult book and I wouldn't be able to summarize it in one go but um, one of the ideas was um, uh, right at the epilogue of this book was the idea of um, of uh, what is uh, what is consciousness you know and um, is it something that is in our brains is it is it a peri phenomenon is it like a meta phenomenon that occurs on top of this platform. And I think his, uh, if I understand correctly, his point of view, and I, what I also come to understand is that the consciousness is something that occurs within our body, but not necessarily in our brain so much. Like I would bet that a lot of that consciousness, you can actually f see it in a, in the spine, maybe, and and maybe distributed in our entire body. Like we have more neurons in our gut than in our our brain. 
I think there's something about the the the, the senses themselves and and our, uh, that how that's distributed in our entire body that is related to consciousness that is in, intrinsic to what makes us human. Sorry, I'm going on yeah, a tangent, but I'm very fascinated with that no, topic. No, because, no uh, I think I, it's I, interesting. And I'll say one more thing on that because I was uh, looking at my daughter, you know, growing up from from a child, you know, when she's when she was really really small, she couldn't really move, and she was completely her muscles were were there, but were completely atrophied, right? So she couldn't. She needed tummy time in order to be able to lift her neck. And it's so interesting how you know clearly there's form of consciousness, but I think her ability to build real consciousness and awareness correlated with her ability to um, move her spine. And I always felt like there was something that started started from way up here, from from the back, from her spine. And as she, as she gradually learned to do tummy time and then crawl and eventually walk, I could see that her consciousness was kind of elevated into her, what, what we perceive now to be our, our minds. And I just found it extremely fascinating. Yeah, I guess I guess to to tie back to that, maybe the human experience and the human mind is human because all these physical experiences that we we have, right? And that uh, drives me to ask, like, why would we want to recreate that in a in a non touchy, non physical environment? Or if we create something in a non touchy, non physical environment, do we expect it to actually have the same? thinking same experience right um just the same type of human and what when you when you talked about touching and you know tommy time i actually thought about this book i was reading about yesterday called i have no mouth and i must scream which is another sci-fi and it's about this about this robot that comes to consciousness but have no ability to you know, do anything. They are, it's basically like a defense robot that controls military stuff. But it, beyond that, it has no, you can't go out for a walk in a park and stuff. And basically, the, because they programmed the robot to be, or the artificial intelligence specifically to be, you know, human like, the artificial intelligence builds up resentment and hatred towards humans. It builds up, uh, yeah, b- builds up all this negative energy against people that can do what he wants to do, and this leads him down to this this very vengeful, vengeful storyline. It's this is not a Philip K. Dick book, by the way. It's just uh, very similar in concept. Yeah, and um, maybe there's something indeed about not having the full faculties of having consciousness, um, or or or. Um... How do you say a damaged consciousness, right? An impotent consciousness that um, and they cannot be expressed through physicality that that breeds resentment to some extent. Maybe that's that's where you're going with this. And I wanted to raise do another shout out to the metaverse because I think that's what you're you're basically questioning there. You know, there's a big push right now for us living in a digital world. Here we are, you know, two buddies having a conversation. But is this it? Is this what we aspire to have as human beings that are conscious? Um, what do you think? Do you think the the metaverse will take off, and what what sort of shape would that need to have? Um, it's a weird question. I, I don't really know. I'm not super familiar with the metaverse. This is like the Mark Zuckerberg 3D environment, virtual reality. Is that what it is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah back to the it's, Sims. It's it looks a bit like the Sims. Back, yeah. Or uh, I mean, Second these Life. things existed. Yeah, Second Life. It, this thing existed before, right? So I, I don't know how much it took off. Bef- took off before. Maybe, maybe it will be popular among certain people. I don't see the the large appeal to it at the moment. That's not to say it, there won't be anything beyond. But yeah, I, I'm not really sold on it to be honest. We just Who haven't knows? seen the the killer app yet for it. Maybe. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, what was Facebook about? Just checking other girls and seeing if they are single, right? right. So that was the killer app, <laughs> right? That, that's that, that's the that was a selling point. And and sex um, sells, right? That's how a lot of a technology adoption has uh, has materialized. Uh, they need to use it for um, edge use cases <laughs> that involve, uh, yeah. Oh, you know, you know what? Maybe that's the trick. Maybe that's the trick. Whatever future technology you create, just make sure you add sex to it. As long well, as you add sex to it, it's fine. 
And that's, and that's a, an important aspect that makes us human because you asked me at the beginning, what is human? And we spoke about it in Sapiens. It's, it's, uh, to be human is to be able to, to be born, to, to feed, and to reproduce. <laughs> and we shouldn't forget about the drive, right? The drive to survive and to reproduce. That's, that's an amazingly powerful drive, uh, driver in life. I'd actually, just uh, another small segue back into uh, Blade Runner. I remember that interesting relationship that he has maybe a bit of a spoiler, with that android uh, lady. At yeah. least it's present in the movie. And it's absolutely fascinating how well it's done in the movie, the the, the tension between the two, right? And uh, and the fact that you don't know whether she is she truly an android or not. Uh, she in she is. In, in the movie, right. she is. In, in the book as well. In The relationship between them in the movie and the book is very different. They are both very complicated, but very, very different. And I think this is where you start to see, you know, the movie in a way was was a movie designed for large audiences. It was designed for people that wanted to have a exciting, thrilling story, but also wanted to have some sort of happy end and positive character arc. So you have the the Rachel, that was her name. And uh, I think Deckard uh, was was the name in the movie as well, and their relationship and their quote unquote love, and how that evolves in the book. Instead, you have the author let his paranoia take place, and things go very differently. So, um, when when did you read this book? When how old were you when you were got exposed to the first uh, Mister Dick book? <laughs> the first Mr. Dick book, I think I was like 16. Um, actual Blade Runner, I probably read it about three months ago. So it's it's not a right. long time ago. Nice yeah. and fresh. It's it's very interesting. It's it's very interesting as well because I think the aspects that I put, picked up on the book now are different what I would have looked at previously, right? Um, and I don't want to spoil it too much, but yeah. No, but maybe just to close off, like, th- can you give three reasons why anyone would pick this book up and and have a look at it reason one it's one of the most unique science fiction stories ever written reason two it's the most unique science fiction story ever written <laughs> <laughs> it it is hard to tell anything else because if it's unique everything is unique the plot uh, device the twists the topics covered the underlying message is nothing what you would expect, especially in today's age. That awesome. That's all I had for you today. And uh, yeah, I hope that I sold you on the idea. Look, and if um, not, I hope I sold someone else. <laughs> I, love, I love your passion for science fiction. This is definitely a classic in the sci-fi genre. Um, thanks so much for sharing that. Sure, absolutely. And uh, yeah, let's wrap this up and I'll talk to you next week. Cool. See ya. Bye-bye.